in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So you deserve our praise, all of our praise. You deserve our praise, all of our praise. You deserve our praise. Sunday worship service here at New Direction Bible Fellowship Church. You can be seated in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 We welcome you here, here at New Direction Bible Fellowship Church in Wilmington, Delaware, where we continue by God's grace and love to make disciples that make disciples through the life-changing word of God. Amen. It's all about the word. Amen. 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 That Pastor Benson will tap into this morning as he continues his series titled Legacy Now. Lord, show me me. Lord, show me me. Amen? Now, if you have your phone or device handy, which I know you do, raise your phone in the air and raise it like you just don't care. Amen, 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 amen. Please, please share today's message through Facebook Live or YouTube that others may be blessed by the word of God on this morning, amen? You can also enjoy today's sermon and prior sermons throughout the week by way of our podcast as you find us and follow us on all social media platforms as well as our website which is ndbf.church ndbf.church our scripture reading for today will be found in Psalms 139 verses 23 and 24 Psalms 139 verse 23 and 24 you can stand at the reading of God's word amen amen Psalms 139 verses 23 and 24. Amen. 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 Are you excited about being in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. 
If it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, where would we be? We find ourselves in the house of the Lord. Great to give you glory, honor, and praise. Psalms 139, verse 23 and 24. Amen. And it reads as such. Uh, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there is any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. Amen. Amen. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there is any grievous way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Let us pray. Let us pray as we enter into the presence of our almighty God. God, once again, we come before your throne of grace and mercy in our time of need. And God, as we enter into your presence, God, we need you. We need you to fill us. We need you to search us. We need you to touch us. We need you to take anything out of us that's not like you. That, God, we can hear your word this morning. God, and not just hear it, but act on it. God, be a doer of what we hear this morning. God, we are so gracious, God, and grateful that you have allowed us to see another day. Help us, God, to take advantage of this day as we stand before your throne of grace and mercy, God. And ask you to fill us with your Holy Spirit that will take out any doubts, Anything, God, again, that's not like you, God, that we may reference you this morning. God, we are so grateful and thankful that you have given us another day to be on this side of heaven, God. So help us right now and prepare our hearts and minds to hear from you in the name of Jesus, God, that we may be changed from the inside out, God. God, we need to change this morning. We want to leave differently, God, than we came in this morning, God. So open us up right now in the precious name of Jesus to hear from you. We need a word from the Lord that will soothe all doubt and take out any fear, God. So have your way this morning. God, we ask your blessing, your anointing over the man of God that will share the powerful and profound word this morning, God. Search his heart in the name of Jesus, God, that he may be able to preach with power and authority and the Holy Spirit, that there will be no limitations, God, in his preaching as he moves by the spirit of our living God. Lord, Take Pastor Benson out the way right now in the name of Jesus that we may hear from you your pure, unadulterated word of God. Again, that that we may be more, conform us right now to be more like you in the name of Jesus, God. And we'll be so careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. For it's in the precious and prestigious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we do pray. Let us all say amen. Amen and amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. I have a few announcements to share, and I'm going to get out your way. Amen, amen. Please continue to use the temperature monitor as you enter the sanctuary. Also, we have hand sanitizing stations around the building. Please provide it for you. Please use them as needed. Amen. Is Ignite in the house this morning? Amen, amen. And I will be celebrating our... Uh, um, uh, a renewed conference again this year at Brandywine Valley Baptist Church that will be on March the 3rd and 4th. All middle school and high school youth are invited to attend. Please see Sister Lucinda for additional details. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. We will celebrate our right hand of fellowship today. Amen. As well as some key introductions and presentations, so please hang around as we commence to do so at the end of our worship service. Amen? Please join us Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. for in-house Bible study. That's in here in the sanctuary, y'all, as Pastor Benson teaches on the topic, Godly Decisions for Daily Living. Godly Decisions for Daily Living. That's a word right there. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. Please continue to pray for our move to Middletown. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Please pray, please pray, pray, and please continue to, to give the building of our new house of worship in Middletown. Amen. Please utilize the yellow envelope. Anybody got a yellow envelope? Deacon Tim, you got a yellow envelope? Amen. Amen. Well, they're out in the foyer. Please use those for your giving for our building. Amen. Our life groups are still going strong. Amen. Amen. And if you have not experienced our life groups as a member, please see me. See me. Amen. For more information. Amen. In regards to that, here's a quick update on our life groups. Our Wilmington life group will be meeting 
today. Hallelujah, amen. Via uh, our Zoom link, and that's at 1.30 p.m. Our Middletown Life Group will be meeting Friday, February the 24th. Hallelujah, let's keep them in prayer. Amen. And our Bear Newcastle and Newark Life Group will be meeting, I believe, next week as well. Amen. We'll be sending out information in regards to that. Our life group has been a blessing to our church. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 It's time to give, y'all. Amen. amen. There should be some excitement when it's time to give. Amen. Amen. We have some giving instructions for you here. You can uh, mail your tithes and offerings to our P.O. Box, which is P.O. Box 687, Middletown, Delaware, 19709. You can also give by web bill pay through our website, which is NBBF. That church, and for all those in attendance this morning, say hey! hey. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Amen, amen. We have a basket set up for you in the rear as you exit. You can place your tithes and offerings, your building fund con contributions, and also your gifts of love for Pastor Benson and Sister Benson in that basket as you exit. Amen. God, we thank you, God, for the opportunity to give back to you. You've been so good to us, God. You have blessed us. You have kept us, God. Uh, and we thank you, God, and we ask right now that you bless the offering, God, as we give it back to you for the building of your kingdom on this side of heaven. God, bless it and multiply it the only way that you can. For us in Christ's name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen and amen. As always, welcome, and thank you for joining us this morning. And I pray that the word of God you hear today will encourage you to reach your full potential in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Worship sing. Hallelujah. There it is. It's a simple song. It simply says, Thank you, Jesus, for all you've done. And I think that sometimes we get so intellectual that we can't think of just the simple thank yous in life. We know so much word and we know so much, so many scriptures. But sometimes we just have to look at our lives and just say thank you. I mean, just recently I, I had COVID. My wife had COVID. Um, grandparents had COVID. And uh, grand, grandparents, it was, it was rough. It was rough. Um, and everyone came out on the other side unscathed and, and healthy with no residual effects. And I was just like, so many people have a different story. And so I just say thank you. And so many of us have, have gone through financial difficulties. So many of us have gone through situations through, you know, 2019, 2020 has been crazy. But we're still here and we're in the house of the Lord. So we got to say thank you. God, we thank you, thank you, thank you.
live, I live to worship you. I live, I live to worship you. section of 32nd and Dolphin, and we were picketing in support of civil rights under the leadership of Dr. Martin Luther King in Philadelphia. I did not understand it, but I was out there with my parents. I was there when the police came to forcibly remove us from the intersection and I witnessed brutality that was inflicted upon my mother and the neighbors as we sought, and they thought, they sought to win the privileges that we so freely enjoy every day. And as I've said on many occasions, the greatest lesson we learn from history is that we do not learn from history. We are standing on the shoulders of our forefathers and mothers, and we have it far better than they, and yet we appreciate it less. I long for the day when we will reflect on the great sacrifices that have been made on our behalf. Sometimes I just look when we are able to go away, and you can look down one street and see 50 establishments. And it's like, look at all the choices we had. There was a time when our family members couldn't even use a public restroom that had for whites only. And yet we can go freely wherever we choose. I pray that a spirit of awareness would come upon the people of God, in particular African Americans, that we would unite around the blessing that caused our parents to stand. And it really wasn't about economics. It was about obeying God. It was about living out the scriptures, not just talking about them. And so we celebrate and we enjoy a reflection on the time where price was paid for us to celebrate a day like this month in honor of those who have made, in many instances, the 
ultimate sacrifice of giving your life. I just want to pause for a moment and just reflect on that um, and let that just resonate, resonate in your spirit. Just pause with me. For the blood that was shed, for the tears that were cried, for every baby, baby that was snatched out of its mother's arms, for every slave who chose death over slavery, for all of those who are still struggling from the dysfunction of families that were deliberately separated, for each family who has an incarcerated male that is serving time in the prisons of the United States because they, in many instances, were raised without the role model of a father. Father, we are lifting up these circumstances because we know that you can and will deliver us out of all of our troubles. God, it is still true that if your people who are called by your name would humble themselves and pray, turn from our wicked ways, you said you would hear from heaven and you would heal our land. And so, God, we're celebrating the sacrifices, but we're also coming before you with repented hearts in a will to change, to become agents that are building the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, may we not be suspicious of one another. May we genuinely have the love of Christ. He said, by this men will know that you are my disciples. May we love up on each other because love in Christ covers a multitude of faults. Father, may we extend to each the same grace that we so willingly and readily receive. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. This is an exciting day, and I'm so grateful to be the shepherd of this house. I'm, I'm grateful for the leadership that God has placed here, and the time that we're spending together. I, when we talk about a church, we have become a family, and that family has been the seed that, that gave birth to it is prayer. And so every morning, Monday through Friday, we join at 6 o'clock for the first 15. And I'm just watching how God is honoring the duty of prayer, the discipline of prayer. And for most of us that are joining that prayer line, it's now become a delight. So please join us on tomorrow if you want to continue to feel the love that you're feeling here. Nothing great happens without prayer. Nothing. And so join us. Now stand on your feet. Glad to have my lovely wife in the house today. Amen. Looking beautiful. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And our scripture reading is taken from Psalm 139. We're continuing the series of sermons I've entitled Legacy Now, Building a Bridge to the Future Through Discipleship Making. Legacy Now, Building a Bridge to the Future. And we read in verse 23, I'm going to ask you to adjust the mic. Thank you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, my anxious thoughts. And see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. On Thursday of this past week, I was in the room with a man whose wife is dying, and he began to proudly share with me that he had been married for 57 years. And looking at him and her, it really didn't look like they were that old. Uh, 57 obviously isn't old, amen? <laughs> and he said, but Pastor, I need to tell you the truth. He said, for 50 of the 57 years of our marriage, 
I had been a closet alcoholic. He said, I worked every day. My kids and my wife lacked for nothing. He said, but there wasn't a single day for 50 years that I did not go to sleep with a, with a bottle in my hand and drunk beyond consciousness. And he said, every morning I would wake up in the same clothes that I went to bed in and I'd wore during that previous day. He said, I'd take a shower, eat my breakfast, and then I'd go to my wife's room because she would no longer sleep in the room with me because of my alcoholism. I kiss her and hug her and I go back to work and then return only to repeat the same cycle of getting totally inebriated, drunk beyond any self-control. But then our 50th anniversary came and I stayed home that day and he said, the way I celebrated, he said, the first thing I did when my feet hit the floor was open up my first bottle. And he said, I spent the entire day drinking everything that I could get down my throat until I literally woke up the next day. He said, my regular routine, he said, I got up, took the shower, and got ready to go to work. And he said, I went in to hug and kiss my wife. He said, but this time something was different. He had, she had her bag packed. And he said, what's going on? Where are you going? He, she said, I'm leaving you. He said, why? Why? Please don't leave. She said, no one should have to tolerate the things that you said to me last night. She said, the horrible things that you said to me, no one would ever say to another person if they loved them. And as she prepared to walk out of the door with her bag, he literally went into a trance. And she thought he was having a seizure or a stroke, so she stopped. And this was like a prolonged state that he was in, and he snapped out of it. But while he was in that trance, God gave him a visual recording of the previous night where he heard himself, and it was like an out-of-body experience. He saw himself drunk cussing his wife out, cursing her, and giving every name, foul name he could think of, he saw himself for the first time. And when he came out of that trance, he just began to weep uncontrollably. He fell to his knees and he begged his wife not to leave, went to his room and he cried for most of the day. And the next thing he did was call Alcohol Anonymous. Seven years passed that experience and he had not taken another drink. What, what was different? God showed him himself. He thought of himself as the best husband any husband could be. I bring the money home. We have a nice house. People down at the church think we are a model family. My children want for nothing. But when God pulled the covers off and allowed him to get a glimpse of how he really was. Amen. Still don't know how to use that. <laughs> it's, it's an enemy. <laughs> he was able to change by not only going to Alcohol Anonymous, but more importantly, he gave himself to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And he's been serving him ever since. Until we have been shown by God ourselves, we will not be able to see ourselves for who we really are. We will think we really are our profile on Facebook and Twitter and other social media platforms. That ain't who you is. That's a representative of you and sometimes a very faulty one because we want to portray ourselves in the 
best light. I find it interesting that in the scriptures, the way God does it is just the reverse of what this man experienced. God will allow us to see him before he shows us us. Moses, after 40 years, was just minding his own business, working as a shepherd, taking care of smelly sheep, walking on the same road in Median that he had traveled for all of those years, and he saw a bush burning, but it wasn't consumed. And he said, I must come aside and see what this thing is. And so God got his attention. God got our attention, too. The Bible says no one can come unto the Father except the Spirit draws him. God got our attention. And, and it may not have been a burning bush, but there was a spirit of conviction burning in our souls. Amen? Yeah. And so he came aside, and he attempted to approach this bush, but he heard a voice speaking out of the bush. And the voice said, Moses, Moses. God knows him and knows us by name. And he said, Moses, remove the sandals on your feet for the ground that you've been walking on for 40 years is now holy ground. It is now holy ground. When Moses got a glimpse of the person who was speaking from the bush, the I am that I am, and he was told that something had to, a transaction needed to occur before you could fully enter into my presence, Moses did not see himself in the way that God showed him himself. God says, this is holy, but you're not. Take off your shoes. So he saw God as holy, and in contrast to the fact that we are not holy. The Bible says that all have sinned. And so when we see ourselves as Moses did, we'll see that we are totally different from a holy God. We are unclean. And so he removed his sandals, and God began to speak to him. The Bible says, in the year the king Uzziah died, Isaiah was given a video from heaven. He had a vision, and he said, I saw the Lord high, and he was lifted up, and the train of his robe was filling the temple, and there were angels surrounding him, and they were singing, holy, holy, holy. And a second group of angels responded, the whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah was caught up in that moment, and he realized the angels belong here. The one on the throne belongs here. I'm not supposed to be here because I'm a man. When you see God for who he is and what he's like, we will recognize the reflection that comes back to us will show us that we're not who we thought we were, and we need, we need, we need God's intervention. Peter, James, and John went up to the mountain with Jesus as they did in previous times. But something, something was different. The Bible says on that day in Mark chapter 9 that the, the appearance of Jesus was transformed. He pulled back the veil that covered his glory just for a brief moment. And Peter, James, and John were able to see the radiant glory of Jesus shining. And then there was Elijah and Moses, and they all showed up. And Peter said, we ain't supposed to be up here. Let's figure out how we can build an altar. And then the Lord spoke. But God showed Peter, James, and John who Jesus was before they could see who they were. You can't serve the Lord until you sit at his feet. Because when you sit at the Lord's feet, he will shine the light of his word on every area of our life. And he will show us ourselves. Saul of Tarsus so he was a bad man. He was persecuting the church dragging Christians out of their homes, throwing them in the prison until he met a bad Savior named Jesus. In Acts chapter 9, the Bible says that Jesus knocked Paul off of his horse, and he saw the resurrected Jesus. And Paul, who had a lot of mouth, a lot to say, had to ask, who are you? And then Jesus, and Paul was never the same. After he saw the resurrected Jesus, he was never the same. The reason why we can remain in our sin and not grow spiritually is because we haven't gotten a real glimpse of what God is like. When we see God for what, we, what he is, we will stop comparing ourselves with ourselves. And we will recognize that the call of God is for us to be conformed to the image of Jesus. Amen? Amen. And so David, when we come to Psalm 139, one of my favorite Psalms in the Bible, he said, Lord, search me. Show me me, Lord, 
if you're going to leave a legacy, if you're going to have a life of consequence, if you're going to be an impact player in the hands of God that fulfills the potential that God has given to each of us, you need to allow the Lord to shine the search light of his word onto your life. David says, search me. Somebody say, search me, Lord. Search me. Amen, amen, amen. Now, the Hebrew word for search means to dig down to the depths of something or someone, to go as far and as deep as you possibly can. I mean, the thought that comes to my mind is these big old ditch diggers, and they go as far as they can. But this kind of digging is not physical, it's supernatural. It also has the idea of examining something to know and understand the very core of its being, the very core, to get down to the essence of who you are. From a biblical perspective, the Hebrew word search means to assess and conclude what does and does not have eternal value in our life. Is it wood, stubble, or hay, precious stone, silver, or gold? To assess and to conclude what has spiritual value in our life. And here is the measuring rod, the word of God. This is the lamp unto our feet. This is the mirror that shows us the flaws, the strengths, and the weaknesses. And so to search means to assess, to evaluate, to analyze, and then come to a conclusion as to does what is seen by God have eternal value or not? David was saying, Lord, I want you to do a supernatural MRI on me. Now watch this. Here, here, here's what's powerful. I, 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 I don't like going inside of anything that's metal. I, I'm not claustrophobic. But if you've ever had an MRI, this is the picture that David is painting when he talks about, Lord, search me from the inside out. Examine me to the core of my being. Dig as deep as you need to to show me what I need to see. There's some things that go wrong with our body that the natural eye is unable to detect. And so what the doctor will do, the doctor will write a script and say, go and get an MRI. And we go and we get the MRI and get inside this metal casket like thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, beads of sweat start forming on your forehead. I'm telling my experience. And you hear, hold your breath. Hold your breath. And then finally they're done, and you're glad, and they get you out of that thing, and then you leave. Now, that's only the first part of it. Once you have had the, the MRI, the, the technician send your information to your doctor. And when she receives it, she evaluates it, and she draws conclusions, and then she develops a strategy for care. Am I right about it? Amen. Now, the fact that your doctor has the MRI results and evaluates them and draws up a plan for you is totally worthless to you if she doesn't give you those results. And so what, what, and we're going to see what David is saying <laughs> is that the results that we need from God's supernatural MRI he already has them. But in order for you to find out what he already knows, we're going to see that we got to do what David did. He said, Lord, search me to tell me what you already know. This is not, this is not to inform God. He already knows. We need to ask, and we'll see. Now, the reason why we should ask God to dig deep to uncover the value of what we do and what, how we think and our motivation. Let me give you three reasons. Go ahead, come and give you four. I know you appreciate a fourth one. <laughs> the first is God knows everything. He's our mission. There's nothing that God is learning. There's not a school that he needs to go to. He doesn't need to be informed. Anything that's noble, God not only knows it, but he knew it before it was noble because he's God. He's inscrutable. His ways are beyond finding out. And so 
when the scripture says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts and my ways higher than your ways, say if the Lord, he's not just talking about we don't think like him. He's talking about the infinite, unlimited amount of knowledge he has. There's no limitation to what God knows. So if, if you want to be searched, it, MRI ain't going to show you what God can show you. Stay with me. Now, now watch what the scripture says in verses 1 through 6. I'm going to kind of carry our way through it. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit, when I rise, and perceive my thoughts from afar off. You discern my going out and my coming, my lying down. You are familiar with how many ways? All my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. You hem me in from behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to obtain. Now, here's what David says. He says, with this, this searching, this, this evaluation that, 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 that he's asking God for in tw verses 23 and 24, it's past tense. He says, you have searched me. You already did it. And the results of your finding are known and understood by you. You understand the very core. Of me. So this, the first thing about this, this process of God showing us us is his past tense to God. Before he formed you, he knew you. Yeah. Every detail, every hair, even the ones we don't have anymore. He knew. Not only is it past tense, but it's personal. He said, you search me. This is not just for those folks that are somewhere else out there. He searched you. The, the, the scripture says that every one of us shall stand before Almighty God and give an account for the things we have done. Each individual, this thing is it, it, it's personal. He searched you. There was no electronic monitor to see what you were carrying in the church today. Um, praise God that he doesn't show what's in our hearts and what happened before we came to church on the screen, on the monitor. But it's personal. Not only is it personal, it's particular. He said, Lord, you did it. This, this, is, a, this is the all-seeing eye of God. He did it. The, the, all of the uh, individuals that God has created, over 8 billion people in the world, God knows you individually and so particular that he didn't assign this to the angels. He didn't assign this to the pastor. He didn't assign this. But he, he said, Lord, you have done this. This, this kind of in-depth, there's a level of you your husband will never understand. There's a level of a man, that the woman you will never understand. There's a level of parenting that we will never fully appreciate. But there is an infinite, omniscient God who understands to the deepest depths of who we are. It's peculiar. He did it. It's personal. It's for us. And not only in that, it's already done. It's past sense, but it's also perfect. He says, you know me completely. All my text messages and all my Facebook stuff that I send to my private friends. And this says I can see how I look in a bathing suit after 50. You ain't showing that to everybody. Those words that we use when we're talking to our buddies and nobody's around. He says, you know me completely. There are no secrets. Every password, I, he knows it. Every account you have, he knows it. Your loved one should know it too, because if something happens to you, the state can get it. He says, "You know, when I sit and when I when I when, when I when I sit down and when I rise, he says, you know my thoughts even before I think them. God, you know my motives and my emotions. You discern." My going in and my coming out. You know why I do what I do, even when I don't know why I said that. Why are you so upset? I don't even know why I'm upset. It's my party, and I cry if I want to. I don't know why I'm crying at my own party. I done dated myself. But in any case, he knows my ways. He knows your actions. He knows your moods. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're all right. <laughs> Dog and written, written hand, you can't find it for the whole day. He knows your moves. 
He knows our ways. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. That's why David says, set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. God knows what you're going to say. And how, how many of you wish you could pull back some of the things that you said? In spite of the fact that God knows everything that there is to know about us to the very deepest depth, to the cores of our being, the scripture says that you hear me from the front and from the back. That means that he encircles you, that he goes before you and behind you. He protects you. He allows goodness and mercy to follow you all the days of life. How do I know? He says, because in the same verse, he says, you stretch your hand and you put it upon my head. That means that God is extending to us in spite of everything he knows about us, divine favor and blessing. And David said, I don't understand this. This is beyond my comprehension. Why would God be so good when he knows so much dirt about me. He hymns me. Oh, I would. Uh, he encamps around me. Angels are guarding and watching over me. In spite of the things that come out of my mouth and the thoughts that come in my head, oh God, you don't want to know the things that I think sometimes. I don't even want to know the things that I think sometimes. But the, the Lord extends to us in spite of us, his grace and his mercy, his favor is on you. His favor is on you. Aren't you glad about that? Yeah. And so we can trust God because he's our mission. He knows everything. The worst thing that you could ever do, God knows. And he still extends his hedge of blessing around you. Here's the second reason in verses 7 through 12. God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. Everywhere that there is somewhere, God is there before we got there. There's not a place where God isn't. And so he can, he can show me me because he's everywhere. He knows everything. He said, if I ascend into heaven, Lord, your spirit is there. If I decide to... To do, to, to, do, to do overnight in hell, behold, even in hell you're there. He said, if I take the wings of the morning and I fly like a bird and I soar as high as beyond the natural eye of what, what, what humans can see, he said, the, the highest height I could go, God, you're even there. He said, Lord, if I go to the farthest depths of the ocean and, and sink to the floor of the ocean as deep as the deepest ocean could be, he said, even there I can't escape you. I can go to Canada. I can go to Germany and put the locks on the door and be with somebody I ain't supposed to be with, turn the lights out, make it pitch black, get it all quiet. He said, no, the darkness won't hide you. The darkness is like day to you, God, because you're everywhere at the same time. There's nothing hidden from you. And so God is everywhere out there. Aren't you glad about that? But it's even better. He's in me. He's not just out there. God is in me. The Bible says, don't you know that you are the temple of God and that his spirit resides? He lives in you. And so God is in the heavens. He's in the ocean. He makes a presence in hell. But more than that, he's in me. Somebody say amen. amen. And here's the thing that David got excited about. God makes sure that we are never out of his sight so that you're never out of his reach. He makes sure. You know how we watch our children? You say, don't go beyond that curve or don't go beyond that step. And as soon as you step, <laughs> You, you, and you, we put all these barriers for little children so they don't climb the stairs. And so, so God, he, know, he knows where we are at all times so that we will never be out of his reach. You can't sink so low that God can't reach you. You can't do so wrong that God, the Bible says that the love of Christ constrains you. He never lets you out of his sight because you will never be out of the reach of God. Sometimes you feel, anybody ever feel abandoned? When I think about all these children being gunned down in Philadelphia, 
I can't imagine how parents feel. I can't imagine the questions that they're asking God. I can't even begin to comprehend the depth of the pain that they're feeling. But no matter how great the pain, you're not out of the reach of God's mercy and his love and his grace, his ability to restore you. When the Titanic made its uh, virgin voyage in 1812, uh, in 19, I'm sorry, in 1912, uh, it was deemed the ship that could never sink. On its first voyage, we know that the, that the uh, Titanic sunk to the bottom of the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, and it sunk 12,500 feet, and it's been at the, left, the depth of that level, 12,500 feet, for 111 years. Now here's what's deep. The scientists can see it. They have special equipment, can show you exactly where it is, but it's beyond their reach. <laughs> it's beyond their reach. No, we can see the rain coming. We can see the hurricane coming. We can see volcanoes coming, but it's beyond our pay grade. We can't stop a hurricane. We can't stop a storm. We can't stop a rain. We can't reach it, but God is not, nothing is beyond his reach. I don't care how far you sink. I don't care how far you run. Jonah thought he could run from God. Isn't it, isn't it something how when we get in sin, you think you can hide from God? Adam and Eve covered themselves. We're not here from God. You are never beyond the reach of God. His mercies never fail. God is not only all-knowing. He knows everything, but he's everywhere. Everywhere. When you're driving home and doing 90 miles an hour on 95, he's there in that car with you. And if you feel like he's not, maybe your guardian angel say, I'm getting off right about here. I'll see you. <laughs> When you get to your destination, it may be in heaven. God is everywhere. He's everywhere. I used to think that God was restricted to the church. I told you all about this. I'd be cussing in. And, 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 and then we come to a church. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I walk and walk a little further. And then I get across the street from the church. And I said, by the way, this is what I meant. Because I didn't want God to hear me cussing. God is not confined by brick and mortar. He's everywhere. We need to understand that when we're having those ungodly arguments at home, that somehow because the church folk ain't there, the pastor ain't there, that, 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 that it, you can talk and say anything that comes to your mind. But no, God is there. Somebody say amen. And you are not beyond his reach of chastisement. God said, I, I chasten those who I love. The rod of correction is, be, is because I love you. Here's a third reason why we can trust God to show us ourselves. We need to see ourselves. When you see yourself, it will humble you. The way up in the, in, in the family of God is not through titles and positions, nor gifts. It's through it's the way up, it's a struggle for the bottom, not for the top. Jesus said, the greatest in the kingdom shall be your, the least shall be your, the servant of all. God also controls everything. He's omnipotent. He's omnipotent. He's all powerful. In Psalm 1, in 139, verses 13 through 18, listen at the, 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 the expressions that are recurrent here. He created, he made, he knitted. Watch this. He says, for, for you created my innermost being. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that for well my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret places when dad and mom were Sneaking and hiding and dodging. I, I, you wouldn't, my frame wasn't hidden from you, Lord. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body all the days. All my days, it could, be, it could read, are ordained for me and written in your book before one of them even came to be. And here we see that God is in creation of life. He is the one before there was an, there, before there was conception between your before the, the fertilized egg became 
a conception occur, God had already determined that you would exist in eternity past. God knew there would be a day and a need for you. And so, so God is in control of, of, of life. The reason why we have life is because God decided let, let, let there be light and let there be life. He breathed into Adam and he became a living nephesh. He became a living soul. And so God is in control of life. That means he controls the reproductive process and he manages every aspect of preconception, conception, labor and delivery. God is even in the labor room. And when you're giving birth, ladies, before you were formed in your womb, he said to Jeremiah, I knew you. And I had already predetermined that you were going to be a prophet to the nations. So before you were even formed through conception, God, God controls the unique characteristics that make you different from every other creature. God did not make you a copy. He made you an original. And so there's no one else in the entire world that's just like you. He said, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My height, my skin color, my intelligence. Everything about me that is different, the length of my hair, the size of my arms, my breasts, my back, all of that. God, you predetermined. Now, we can shrink some things, and we can expand some things. We can push some plates away. So don't, we ain't going to blame everything on God. But what God made, he said, it is fearfully and it's wonderfully made. And you're unique. There's no one else like you. And when you decide that when, once God shows you yourself you, and you see yourself as he sees you, you will accept yourself and you will not worry about what other people think or say about you. He controls the length of your life. He says all the days of my life are already ordained and written in your book. You're not going to live a single day longer than God has already predetermined. The moment that you were conceived in your mother's womb, the hourglass, the sand glass, begin to trinkle down. And when every granule of that sand, when the, when the works of your day are done, you will not be able to work again because God will say to your soul and to my soul, return. I don't care what doctor you got. I don't care how much insurance you got. I don't care how much you go to the gym. When God says return, you will breathe your last and you will die. And the Bible says there will be a separation from the body and the soul. And for those who know Jesus to be absent from the body means that you'll be present with the Lord. God controls the length of your day. You go, I ain't getting on the plane. You know the Lord said, Lo, I will be with you always. He didn't say hi. Here's one thing that God doesn't control. He controls when we're born, controls how long we live, controls our unique DNA profile, but he doesn't control our will. You can say no to God. <laughs> oh, I like what Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 says. I call heaven and earth as a witness today, God speaking to the nation of Israel, against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings, Therefore, here, choice, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. God does not control your will. He doesn't control your will. I believe that people can die prematurely, that God gives us a length of days that's predetermined. But if you decide to do what Cain did, it was not God's will that Abel would die. That was outside of God's will. We have what God has called the perfect will and the permissive will of God. You can, you can rush this. You can commit suicide. And there are multiple young people that are turning to that as an alternative. How many of you know that suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem? No matter what you're going through, there is an answer. And so we can trust God because he knows everything. He created you. He watched over you in your mother's womb. Out of all of the sperm that connected to your mother's egg, he chose yours to survive. And I don't care what kind of parents you had, they, God used them to get you here. And if they never do anything else for you, you are alive because God used them to allow you to be here. Here's the final thing. God's God can be trusted because he knows everything. God can be trusted because he's everywhere. God can be trusted because he knows that God has all power. But God also, God will show you who you really are if you ask with a sincere heart. He's already searched you. 
He knows what you're going to say before you say it. He knows how you're going to think, all that. But if you don't, and David, this is a prayer. David asked the Lord, search me and try me to see if there's anything that's not like you. So he's asking God to do something that God has already done because David needed the results of the exam. God, the doctor, had the conclusions. But Lord, explain them to me. And so he asked the questions, Lord, Lord. And the first thing, he, there's a two-part prayer. He said, Lord, deal with my enemies because they're your enemies. When you read that passage in verse 19 through 22, it may, make, it may seem like a heart. David said, I hate them. Well, how can a Christian hate? He said, I hate them because they hate you. And so the same kind of hatred that God has for evil, David said, I have for evil. Deal with them because they're trying to destroy me because I love you. Don't go around telling people you hate them, though, okay? And I hate you with a perfect hatred. <laughs> no, no, no. We, we're praying for you. All right. Then he says, Lord, deal with me by showing me. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and show me my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me to the path of life. The first thing he said, Lord, what does your word reveal about my heart? Here's, 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 the Bible says that the word is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints of marrow. And he says, it is a discern of the thoughts and sense of heart. In other words, he said, Lord, your words separate the soul and the spirit and the joints of the marrow. Here's what I want you to do with that, that supernatural MRI. I want you to show me my motives. Show me why I'm thinking the way I'm thinking. Lord, show me. Show me me. What does your word conclude about my heart, Lord? Show me that. Test me, Lord. Give me the test results when you check out why I sung today. When you show me, show me why I showed up at church today. Show me why I'm praying every day, Monday through Friday. Is it really because I want to please you or is it because some other ungodly reason? Lord, is this just religion or is this trying to be righteous? Am I trying to grow or am I trying to pray? Lord, test me and show me the results of what I'm doing to, to see if I'm passing what you've required of me because all of my righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Lord, why am I anxious? Anybody ever anxious or fearful, worrying? When you are fearful, worrying, anxious, you're not trusting. Show me, Lord, what is causing me to be anxious. And then finally he says, Lord, what are the ungodly ways in my life? Here's a question you need to ask, and this is a sermon might, you might hear. What could take you out in your spiritually? Show me my ways, Lord. Show, show me my habits, the ones that I am not aware of, what I'm blinded to. We all have blind spots. You think you got it going. No, you don't. Who is it that can tell you, no, baby? No. My wife's looking at me right now. Okay. All right. There are some people who should be able to tell you that there's certain things, certain habits that you have that do not reflect God. David said, Lord, show me me. You already did the MRI. You know my thoughts. You know my ways. You know the words I'm going to say before I say them. And you still love me and bless me. And I can be, I'm going to have to be scared until you just pull out the exam. Just tell me all of it, the bad and the good. Because I know your favor is, God will not remove his favor because we're asking him to show us. So he humbled himself. My aunt, stand with me, 32 years old. She died not long after her husband, who was 32. She had 10 children at 32. She had four siblings. And once she died, we actually, I, the way this turned out, my grandmother took all 10 of those kids. She didn't live long. And it wasn't because of the children or some, some other medical things. And I'm sure that if the family could do it again, they would not have given the 10 children to, the, to, the, to my grandmother. She died. They divided the children. My mother took four. She already had five of her own. The other siblings took two each, two, two, three, so there were 10. And so 
I had a cousin who I loved very much. I'm not going to call her name. She might be watching right now. And she was a little older than me. I loved her, but the way I showed it was, in my own way, was expressions of affection. I teased her mercilessly. <laughs> I'd pull her hair. I ain't gonna tell you some other things I did. I mean, I, yeah, I was just having fun. Sometimes I would tease her so brutally that she would actually come to tears. Don't be mad at me. <laughs> I was just having fun. I thought she understood. I only did that because. In my mind, she was really special. One day, I went to teasing her. She didn't cry. She said to me, you are the worst human being I've ever met. She said, you're mean, you're unkind, you're selfish. And by the way, if you're laughing at somebody and they're not laughing with you, it's not funny. She just went through this whole list of vocabulary. I didn't even know she had a vocabulary like that. She was just slicing. Oh, oh, oh. I was so shocked that that's how she saw me. And then the Lord showed me through her eyes that that was really the person I was. I was mean. I was cruel. I was unfair. But until I saw myself through another person's eyes who I was hurting, I didn't get it. I want you to know that each one of us can stand in the mirror of the word of God and cry out like David, Lord, search the depths of my innermost being and give me the results so I can change. I'm tired of just going to church, tired of just going through the motions, tired of pretending it. And people think we're the greatest. We got the worst marriage you could ever imagine. You would never even begin to believe it. But if I'm not telling you to point you at your husband or your wife. I'm saying, look and, and ask God, show you where you need to change, what you need to do differently. And when you do, the Bible says that God will change you and you will become like Jesus. Anybody want power? Anybody want to walk in authority? Well, then let God show you you. And when you see yourself as he sees you, God will change you if you surrender to him. Somebody say, Lord, show me me. Amen. I still owe my cousin an apology. I don't believe I ever apologized to him. That's why I believe the Lord put that on my heart. I need to call her and say, you know, I never meant to, meant it to hurt you that way. Is there somebody that you hurt? Is there somebody that you think a certain way about? And it may not, it's not even true. You found out it wasn't true, but it affected your relationship with them. Is it a family member? Is it a, is it a co-worker? If your words might help them to see themselves as God sees them. I'm so glad you changed me, Lord. Father, my heart was broken when I realized that my cousin saw me in the way that she did. And Lord, the truth is, is that my insensitivity and in immaturity, there was an acts of, there was just being a bully. Father, we, we hear that word all the time, but I know that's what I was. But I thank you that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. I'm so grateful, Lord, that you said if we confess our sins, you are faithful and you're just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, when Moses saw you, he was never the same. When Isaiah saw you and then saw himself, he was never the same man. Peter, James, and John, they saw you 
transfigured, they were never the same. Father, I pray that we will not leave this church today as you have reflected through your word, the mirror of your word, and given us a glimpse of ourselves. May we not leave the same way we came. In Jesus' name, amen. You may remain standing. We're going to do three things. We're going to bear, ask you to bear with us. We're going to extend an invitation for salvation. Have a right hand of fellowship for the, those who have joined us. And then we want to acknowledge a special group of couples uh, who are being honored by some of you who are, who are in our midst today. Amen. So as your heads are bowed, the Bible says, from the mouth of babes, his children shall lead you. Sometimes the people who will be honest with us are the people that we would listen to the least, children. Isn't it interesting how children will not spend time with people, adults, that are mean? Mm hmm they won't. They just know. My point is this. You may not think of yourself as a sinner, but sin simply means that you missed the mark. You've fallen short of God's perfect standard. All of us have. None of us have lived a sinless life. The only person that did that was Jesus, and sinful man killed Jesus. Thank God that that wasn't the end of the story. So I, I'm extending to you an opportunity to acknowledge that you are a sinner and you need Jesus. I'm also glad to let you know that God has made a provision for our sin. The Bible says that God so loved you that he gave his only son that through faith in Christ you can have the gift of the gift, the gift, the gift of eternal life. In order to receive this gift that even while we were still in our sins, the Bible says God proved that he loved us. He hedged us, encircled us, protected us by sending the provision called the blood of Jesus. Through the suffering of Christ on the cross, he, every sin, past, present, and future is forgiven. So the scripture says, if you say with your mouth, agree with God that Jesus is Corias, that he's Lord, that he's God in human form, and that he is Savior, the one who paid the price for our sin. The Bible says, you shall be saved. Not might be, but you shall be this very moment saved from your sin, the power, the guilt, and one day from the very presence of sin. If you want to trust Christ as your Savior, today. Would you simply raise your hand right where you are? Right where you are, I'm going to say yes to Jesus. Is there one that would say yes? So glad he changed me. Mm -hmm. If you're here today and you are a Christian but you don't have a church home, the Lord is saying this is where he wants you to unite. Would you raise your hand right where you are? Is there one? Is there one? Maybe you're watching from live stream and you want to become a part of this fellowship. Please uh, contact us and we will definitely give you the information you need. Are you here today and you are in a backslidden condition? You have walked away from the Lord. You are presently living in sin, but you have heard from the Lord today and you want to turn. You want to come back to him. Would you raise your hand right now? We'll pray for you right where you are. I'm so glad he changed me. Mm, wonderful change. Amen. You may be seated. Come over. Amen.
praise the Lord. Amen, amen. Mm -hmm. At this time, we are excited to welcome into the body of New Direction.